Okay, so how can I help you today? Uh, please tell me, why, why had you decided to create this party? It turned out that politicians do not really understand the internet, and it's worse than that. They think they understand the internet as secretaries print their emails for them. So lobbyists for old industries had the entire upper hand when it came to cracking down on communicating with the net. It turned out that the only way to get a real change was to threaten the politicians job over it. If you don't start respecting free speech and civil liberties online, we're going to take your job from you. And that worked, that worked beautifully. Politicians all over Europe are now at least aware that there is a pirate party in the shadows and if they crack down on free speech too much, then they might lose their job. What are your main principles? We're talking about how the same rights that our parents had should also apply to our children as they move into the online landscape. When I put a letter in the mailbox, the physical mailbox, then I and I alone choose if I put my letter on the, if I put my, my name as sender on the outside, on the inside or not at all. Nobody has the right to open that letter in transit and nobody has the right to track whom I am communicating with. It is entirely reasonable that our children enjoy the same rights as they move online. But there are a lot of industries whose business models would crumble if this happened. Well, that's their problem, frankly. If they can't sustain a business in the face of civil liberties, then they have to change their business. We should not dismantle our civil liberties because of that. How many people are in your unity? Ah. The Swedish Pirate Party has uh, varied a bit in size. Uh, when, when election years come about, people become more politically active. So in the European elections, we were 50,000 in the Swedish Pirate Party. Today, we are right between Swedish election, elections, so uh, interest is a little less. We're currently about 8,000 people. But on the other hand, those are much more active. If you're looking at Europe, where we have pirate parties in many, many countries, one of the largest would be the German Pirate Party right now with 20,000 members. They also had a smashing success in Berlin, the state elections there, where they took 9% and 15 other seats in the Berlin Parliament. What is your opinion about ACTA? And if it is, why it is harmful? We are very concerned about ACTA for two reasons. First, it is repressive legislation that is disguised as a trade agreement. This means that it was negotiated in secret by these incumbent industries that essentially want to kill off the internet. And I'm very concerned by that. Even if the content of ACTA was good, which is not, then no law should be made in that manner. No law should be negotiated in secret. And even our members of parliament can't see it and they don't even get to understand what it says when they vote on it. That is atrocious from a democratic perspective. Second, if you look at its content, then it's quite clear that this is designed to crack down on the ability of free speech over the net to favor a couple of obsolete, frankly, industries that tried to control what we say to each other and make money off of it because that's the way they distribute music. Now, it's true that ACTA has been watered down somewhat, but for instance, it locks in the, uh, the fact that these obsolete industries can track down who we are and what we say online. And I, I don't think any private industry should have that right. In Sweden, they even have more extensive rights than the Swedish police. And that's not as a, the way a society should work. Um, not a long time ago, you had some demonstrations against ACTA in Sweden. So uh, what atmosphere is there now? We are very hopeful. Those rallies that were held last Saturday against ACTA here in Sweden 
we had a great turnout. I mean, <laughs> after all, February in northern parts of Europe, it's not where you usually hold a rally if you want people to turn out because you'll get maybe 30 or 40 people huttering in the cold. But we filled the largest square in Stockholm. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't hope for more. There was a great demonstration of strength and resolve for our human rights. And for the first time, I think media picked up on the message that we are not fighting to get something for free. We are, fa we are fighting for our most basic civil liberties. And we had our rallies one week ahead of most of Europe. That, it just turned out that way. But I'm hoping for many, many rallies across Europe as we approach this weekend as well, sending a very clear message to the politicians who are going to vote on this. We are not happy with the way you don't concern yourselves with our civil liberties and freedom of speech online. If you don't start paying attention, we are going to kick you out of office. 250 million Europeans who share and preserve our common culture is not a problem. It is a power base of 250 million voters who will kick you out of office if you don't start respecting our desire to share and preserve culture. Um, there were a lot of people with masks. Uh, what is the meaning of uh, them? The Guy Fawkes mask that has become synonymous with the online movement called Anonymous is a way to express that in the end it's only the ideas that matter. If you express an idea that idea should not be judged on the merits of who you are, who put it forward, but rather on the merits of the idea itself. This is an idea that, or a concept that dates back to the Enlightenment. And I think it also reflects how tired we are as citizens that a small elite of ultra-rich corporations are able to set the agenda because of who they are. So this anonymous movement highlights the fact that ideas matter. Who puts them forward? Not so much. Uh, okay, let's speak about a uh, very interesting religion like copernism. What is it? Right. it? It originated with a philosophy student in Uppsala, a uh, university town in Sweden, who basically looked at copying and remixing and thought that the, these could be religious concepts. I'm now, I'm not a religious person, so I can't relate to this on a religious level. But logically, I can see that since all life comes from copying and remixing of our genes, then it's not completely out of the blue to hold copying and remixing as somehow connected with life itself. And so a couple of people are starting to do just that on, a, on the philosophical and religious level. What that brings us is uh, essentially the next level of this philosophy that we are going very, very ideological and philosophical about the importance of sharing, preserving, and remixing. Also, it has some interesting legal connotations as um, there's this issue of confessional, as in if you're confessing your sins to a preacher of any religion, then uh, that conversation is legally protected. It cannot be used against you in a court of law and so on. And since this church has copying as its sacrament and confessional, that means that sessions of copying and remixing cannot be used against you in a court of law. So it does have some interesting legal connotations, but I don't think that's the the uh, main source of it. It's more like an interesting consequence. Um, does this church have some kind of pope or a religious leader? And uh, are they taking some kind of devotions or praise? There is the founder of this church, the uh, pastor Isaac Gerson, the philosophy student in Uppsala. Other than that, I think the church is quite intense in its uh, insistence that everybody who copies and remixes becomes a priest or the church and 
they hold their sacraments to be this copying and remixing with copying and pasting being holy acts and holy symbols. Now, as I said, I'm not, not a religious man, so I can only relate to this on a logical level, but still, I, I think it's a very interesting concept. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, bye. Bye.